Oh my goodness, this is really happening. <laughs> Thank you so much everybody for coming along. We really hope that you've enjoyed those three films and um, particularly obviously the one that uh, has just gone live for the first time ever today. And thanks so much to Cornwall Film Festival for um, having this premiere here. It's been fantastic. Um, we're joined on the stage now by some of the faces that you're obviously going to recognise from the films and um, it would be great if you've got any questions at all to put to them. We've got Matt Slater here, who's the um, Marine Awareness Officer of the Cornwall Wildlife Trust, who you saw in the fishing film, Ruth Williams, who's the Marine Conservation Manager from the Cornwall Wildlife Trust. We've also got Justin Ridgewell, who wasn't in the um, last film, but he is the EA's um, coastal advisor. Um, for Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly and he's incredibly knowledgeable if you've got any questions at all about what's happening with our coast and of course uh, Dave Watkins um, who's recently retired but is absolutely the godfather of everything to do with flood and coastal risk in Cornwall and the wonderful Sue Sayer from the Cornwall Seal Group Research Trust um, we'd love to take questions from the hall and we've also got oh so sorry we've also got Brian e. Stokes who's the director who actually made the film so she's quite important <laughs> I was leaving the best for last, they and then, all know me anyway. then I forgot. <laughs> yeah, she's too famous to mention. Um, and uh, we've also got over 100 people who've been watching online, so we're going to take some questions from um, the YouTube channel as well. Um, so um, we've got a roving mic, I think, and if anybody's got a question, please do put your hands up. Is there a plan to introduce these films into schools throughout Cornwall? Is there a plan to... That's you. Well, sorry, I didn't hear the question. Is there, was there, is there a plan to introduce the films to schools throughout Cornwall? Yes, there definitely is. <laughs> yes. Um, so, uh, actually, some of our secondary schools have already been using them, but we've, um, behind this, we've been working with a group of teachers developing resources, um, not just for science and geography, where climate change is normally taught, but across English and other subjects. So it can be completely cross-curriculum. And we're going to start going out to schools as of January doing assemblies and screenings. So if anybody's interested and has a school that they know that would um, like to host something, please do get in touch with us. Louisa, someone else? Oh, sorry. Thank you, and congratulations. I think that's really beautifully done. Oh, where am I getting that from? Is that better? Um, I'm a new town councillor for this ward. We're quite close to the sea. Okay, can you hear me? Um, yeah, um, you know, we, we are vulnerable here in Falmouth. Um, and I'm sitting with a group of town and Cornwall councillors. And I'm just wondering from each of you, what is one good thing that a councillor, whether town councillor somewhere like this that's vulnerable or somebody at Cornwall Council, uh, can do uh, to prepare for what's coming to us. Can we start with, can we start with you, Matt? <laughs> <laughs> can we start the other end? I'll, start. <laughs> I'll go. <laughs> um, I think, um, from my point of view, um, to tackle both the climate and the ecological crisis, there's something that we can do locally, and that's to... to um, start to protect some of our blue carbon habitats. We've got incredible merle and seagrass and deep sea sediments and kelp beds, all sorts of um, habitats around Falmouth, um, as well as the, the broader Cornish coast. And it's different to managing land. We don't need to plant more trees. We don't need to, to effectively manage um, those habitats. We just need to remove some of those pressures. And there's easy things we can do in Falmouth particularly for things like our seagrass beds, we can remove and change mooring systems so that those, those seagrass beds can recover and restore. We can um, help to improve our water quality. So those, again, those habitats have better water so they can thrive and, and grow again. So there's, there's simple things that we can do to help to look after those habitats and give them the space to, to thrive and recover. So I think that'd be my top tip. Very good. Go next? Yeah. yeah. I, I guess from my point of view, the, the thing that I would implore uh, local councillors and any 
elected officials to do is to start to think long term, think our uh, political system. I'll try again. I think our political system lends itself to sort of short term thinking because politicians tend to be looking at the next electoral cycle, which can be just four or five years away. But that just doesn't fit with climate change and the sort of the, the timescales that we're talking about. I think we need to see our elected officials thinking longer term. And what we've all got to accept, both elected officials and as society, is that we need to accept some short-term pain for, for long-term gain. But that's not always seen as a vote winner. So it's a, you know, it's a huge challenge for all politicians, but I think it's what we have to do and accept as society that it's where we need to go. So it's all about long-term thinking. Um, if you haven't come across it, do look at the um, Cornwall Council Climate Change Development Plan document, which is uh, with the planning inspector at the moment. We'll probably come back again for consultation. So support the, the DPD, because it do, does cover coastal erosion as well as climate change. And um, local councils can declare themselves, as Nuki did, as a, um, a coastal change management area and think about adaptation and what that coastal change means and how you plan for it for the future. So support the climate change DPD, think about becoming a coastal change management area, start thinking about coastal change adaptation plans. Well, I feel hugely optimistic that we do have some political representatives here. Thank you for the question. And also that as, uh, as their elected officials, we need to remember what we're doing when we vote as well, because if we have a vote, we need to use it wisely. Uh, I've just got a couple of things. I think um, the biggest threats to our planet are things like, there are four, blue blindness. I think most of us aren't aware of what's going on with the ocean at all, and I think it's really important that we start to educate people and recognise that. Denial. There's been denial for a long time, hasn't there? Uh, apathy. How actively involved in this are we prepared to get? And there's an awful lot of myths and misconceptions out there, so we need to try and get to facts. But uh, that last film made me cry, I have to admit. I was welling up, and uh, I wrote this down because I think it's really important, and it's that our biggest mistake will be to prioritise people, us and ourselves, when we, what we really need to prioritise is nature because that's where the solutions will be. So we need to think about that too, long-term and nature, how, that, how we can make that work for us and help us. Um, yeah, I think um, they're all really good points. I think in Cornwall, we've got to be looking at our energy and our carbon footprint and looking at renewable energy is going to be really important and also how we export that to the rest of the country because at the moment it's difficult. And then equally, we've got a big um, footprint from our diets as well. So it was mentioned in the film about fishing, but eating local and not eating seafood that's tra been transported halfway around the world. So um, yeah, both, uh, both very important things to focus on. Thanks, thanks everyone. We've got a question here that's come in from online. How involved are town councils in adaptation planning for their locality? they should have access to this film too. Um, Dave or Justin, do you have any comments on how involved local council, town councils are in adaptation planning? I think they need um, help. Um, very impressed at how many local councils have declared climate emergencies locally, on top of Cornwall Council doing it more regionally. And as that part of that process, you have to say, well, I'm declaring a climate change emergency next question, what am I going to do about it? What does it mean? And um, I think there, there is scope for Cornwall Council to help local councils do that, um, because otherwise they may be floundering around saying, yeah, what do we do about it? How, how, how do we do this? Um, they need to come together, talk amongst themselves, share practices, and I think probably Cornwall Council's role in coordinating that. But um, Generally, I think you know, the, the councils have stepped up. 
the local councils have declared so many climate emergencies are called. Well, I think that is really encouraging. Thanks, Dave. We've got a question down here at the front. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Um, it's Rob Hicks here from Ocean Rebellion. We've been trying to get meetings with George Eustace for several years now and we still haven't actually managed that at all. I was really hoping that you guys would have been able to provide this information to the Environment Minister and maybe get some sort of meaningful response, even if that's just to acknowledge that there's a problem, not necessarily presenting the usual, we are world leaders, da, da, da. Is that the case? Have you managed, have you tried or managed to achieve any dialogue whatsoever with national government that's essential to give us the mandate to act on a local level? Anyone? Well, I'm afraid from the film's perspective, we haven't been very successful yet. We did invite all of the Cornish MPs to come along today or attend online, but we didn't get any response from anybody. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but how about any of you guys? You've had a lot more actual real discussions with MPs, haven't you? Um, we, we liaise with um, our local MPs on a regular basis through the Cornwall Wildlife Trust um, and try to highlight all sorts of issues. Um, key ones at the moment are to let nature help um, in terms of addressing the climate and the ecological crisis. It's been brought to a fore this year with um, both the G7 and the COP26 summits. So the, the, the discussions have been had with our local MPs, it's the next stage of getting them to, to act on those. So um, cynically, they talk the talk when we have those meetings. It's putting it into the next stage of, of them taking action. Um, one positive thing um, in George Eustace's defence is that he has been spearheading the, the work for highly protected marine areas. He, um, he he and Richard Benyon and several others um, have taken up the, the mantle of seeing marine protected areas as being um, something, a legacy that they want to leave. Highly protected marine areas are the next level. They're the gold standard. That's what we want to see achieve. It's, it's protecting that sea bed, that sea area as a whole, not just as a features-based approach. And that's crucial. So it's, it's protecting that whole ecosystem. Um, it's very slow to, to move forward, but George Eustace in particular has, has been um, instrumental in making sure that DEFRA are bringing forward a consultation. There's been ecological criteria um, out this summer, which we have um, submitted third party responses to. Lots and lots of people um, around the, um, the whole of England have responded to that. And they're in the process of shortlisting those sites at the moment. So hopefully we will get highly protected <coughs> excuse me, highly protected marine areas in the near future. They're supposed to be designated by the end of 2022 um, with further consultation in this, this, this coming year. The problem is they're only talking about designating five <laughs> across the whole of England, and that's, that's not enough. Um, and what we need our politicians to do is to start thinking a bit more rapidly. We need... We, you know, we need to take action. We, we know there are solutions out there. We know what nature can do. We've all heard about 30 by 30. 30 isn't, isn't very long away. You know, we're talking nine, eight, nine years. And we have to put action in place now to, to start making those, those things happen. And I, I would add to that that the, um, <clears throat> from an environment agency point of view, we've had a, a new national uh, flood and coastal erosion risk management strategy, which has been adopted earlier this year. Um, and that highlights the importance of, of nature-based solutions as the, as the key element to, to, to how we manage the coast and risks at the coast going forward. Um, and obviously we are sponsored, we are a, you know, a quasi-government department, we're sponsored by DEFRA. So those messages, they're very powerful messages that our national strategy is highlighting that nature-based solutions need to be mainstreamed. We can't just depend on building walls higher engineered defences, that needs to become by exception rather than the rule. Um, so I think that the message is there and it, it, it's, you know, it, it's incumbent upon us as, as area teams within the Environment Agency to, 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 um, to, to spread the word, to send those messages coming from local communities up through the organisation in, and into DEFRA and hopefully to the, to the ear of, of George Eustace. So you know, we, do have, we do have those routes of communication. 
Thank you, Rob, for that question. I think I just wanted to say that one of the driving forces behind the films, even at four in the morning when my eyes are tired, is, is that a despair, a lack of action. So obviously, I think as a filmmaker, the only thing that we can do is give people a voice of what's actually happening in our local areas. And we have been encouraged by the action in Cornwall. I think there's some amazing work going out there, you guys included, and that's, yeah, obviously we would we will be pushing for them to be screened and viewed, but <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> She's handed me back the mic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we, we, we have been amazed at the, the response to the films, um, you know, and, and of course, because we had to start during COVID, which was completely unexpected, um, with online launches, which we never anticipated doing, you know, the, the reach has been so much beyond what we'd ever expected in the first place, um, you know, actually global, and um, it's, it's growing. And I think because we're covering every community in Cornwall eventually and so many different themes, our hope really is that by the end of the series, everybody in Cornwall is going to have had interest in seeing at least one of these films and um, you know, really understand that this is something that's affecting us here. And it's very important that we all deal with it as well. It's not just something happening at, in 2050 in the Marshall Islands. You know, um, we all have to get on board and we will get the MPs seeing them soon, I'm sure. <laughs> um, right, I've got a question. Oh, Brendan's got a question, sorry. Can you hear me through my mask? Brilliant. I thought it was inspired that you got the fishing voice, and I wondered if, one, you'd had much response from the fishing community to their voice being expounded, and two, I wonder if the way to get the politicians involved is to do an MP's version of the film. This is their climate story, and maybe they will actually engage if they're going to be left out of the one of five. I think you're probably right. I think we need to do something a little bit special for the MPs, probably. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe we can talk to you about that, Brendan, and get some good ideas from you. Um, it might, might not be our, our strong point. And um, yeah, we, we've had a really good response to the fishing film, actually. I, I did a um, screening uh, a few weeks ago with, um, in Mevagissi and uh, with the parish council, actually, and they were all very excited. Um, Obviously, it's, it's difficult to get fishermen along to the room to watch films because they're very, very busy people and they work strange hours at, uh, you know, very much at the behest of the, the tides and the weather. Um, but they, they were very keen um, to try and tie in with um, uh, the fishing festival happening in the summer and actually maybe have something um, screened in the harbour there in Mevagissi and maybe some other fishing towns, um, which could include times when the, so many tourists are down and they can be learning about sustainable fish as well and the impact of climate change on our fishing community and really sort of bring this film into the heart of the community and engage with the fishing, the fishing community rather than, you know, trying to make them hostile to us. <laughs> Thank you. I've got another question here from online um, from Sue Gross. Sue Gross. Another brilliant and important film. Thank you. Can you tell us, Bryony, about how the aerial shots were taken and about the music? I can, yes. I am not a drone pilot. None of them were me. But we've really enjoyed working with um, local talent in Cornwall. It's been really important. All the musicians are Cornish. Um, and uh, we basically found that it, it was a brilliant opportunity to reach out and work with all the amazing filmmakers out there. So the drone um, aerial shots are all from different people around Cornwall who have either already shot stuff or went out and shot stuff for us. Um, a lot of the, the B-roll, you know, I didn't spend six months underwater for the first film. I got a really talent, you know, tapped into some really amazing stock footage from people that spend their lives underwater shooting that stuff. Um, so we found that we can make the films quicker that way, we can keep our carbon impacts of the films down, and we can also sh spread the word of uh, the amazing talent that is in Cornwall. Did that cover that? Music? Yes, music uh, is, yes, also, we, we, so that was three different music, uh, bands in three different films. Um, 
they, it was all music that had already been created but had had the um, vocals taken off because obviously if you've got vocals underneath you can't really hear what people are saying it's very content rich um, so yeah we've been working with bands that have just been really up for letting us use their music edit their music and then obviously you can hear a bit of the vocals at the end if anybody um, knows of any other Cornish musicians that would like to work with us we're trying to use a different uh, group each, each film um, and I'd like to just say a massive thank you to, to all of the musicians and um, filmmakers that have worked with us because it's just it was amazing to see them big screen for me it it looks brilliant from the fishermen that sent us in footage on their phones to the 4k stuff aerial footage it it yeah it was brilliant to see it so thank you everybody who's not here <laughs> um great i've got a question here for matt slater um the film talks about what will happen as our seas warm, but is it possible it could actually get colder as Arctic ice melts more catastrophically in the future? Sea temperature was actually much colder than usual at the beginning of this year, and did this lead to any unexpected developments in the fish being caught around the Cornish coast? We did, yeah, we did have a bit of a slow start to the warming this spring, which meant um, it actually impacted on the crab fishermen quite a lot, who were finding they were, you know, the crabs weren't weren't. Um, foraging for feed and therefore not getting caught in the traps. Um, I'm not actually, <laughs> people think I know everything about the sea, but I, I do know quite a lot and I can talk for hours and hours about it, but I'm afraid I'm not an expert on, um, on oceanography and what could happen with, with climate change in terms of um, whether we might see dips and troughs. I don't know if anyone else in, in the, on the panel is, but... Um, I think all the evidence at the moment is showing that actually sea temperatures are, are on average rising, but they fluctuate. And um, so, you know, we might, we might get ups and downs, but the trend is upwards, as far as I'm aware. Maybe Wally the walrus might have been a bit of a, an out... We've always been in an interesting place, haven't we, here in the southwest England, because we've got a real mixture of warm and cool water species that turn up. And there's always this random factor with species moving around. You know, we've, we've always had strange warm water species, but equally we sometimes find strange cool water species, and that is kind of how it is. And I wouldn't I'd read too much into, say, one, one individual animal turning up, like Wally the walrus, at this stage. But who knows, you know? We might find that... Um, there's a trend in future years. And it's very sad to hear about the uh, loss of habitat for walruses and the you know, loss of ice, ice flows, etc. You know, we could get surprises. Like walruses becoming abundant. Is that possible? Sue knows a lot more about pinnipeds than I do. Well, yes, I don't know an awful lot about walrus, though. I had to contact somebody in Alaska to learn about walrus. Uh, but the walrus taught us something really interesting, which is that we don't like managing ourselves. We would prefer to get rid of things that are inconvenient for us. And I think there's a very, very important lesson there that we need to learn to manage ourselves rather than manage wildlife or nature because we're not very good at it. Uh, but it's inconvenient and it's challenging and it's difficult. So things are going to get harder for sure. Uh, and I suspect that that won't be the last walrus. Uh, there's certainly one on the east coast of Scotland at the minute that's come from Holland. Uh, and we're just about to potentially collaborate with people in New Zealand who have had OFA, the leopard seal, uh, to write a paper about how you actually help people to be managed around out-of-habitat species, of which we're probably going to get more. Thank you, Sue. That's great. I think we're out of time now, Louise. One last question. So my, my question is more about as individuals, what is the best thing that we can do to help? Um, so it, did the video say that 90% of the food that we fish is exported and 90% of the seafood that we eat is imported, which sounds insane to me. Um, so for example, is it the case that if we go to local fishmongers, we're more likely to get local food, whereas if we go to a supermarket, we're more likely to be, get imported food? Is, is that correct? And if so, you know, um, just a small plug for Falmouth Food Co-op. A few of you probably use it. Um, they, it's not seafood, but they, they, they source food from local farmers. Um, so you're not getting food that's traveled thousands and thousands of miles. So as we're in Falmouth, um, if you've not heard of Falmouth Food Co-op, check it out because it's, you know, it's, it's a simple thing we can do is just buying food that's local, right? It's, I mean, it just sounds insane to me, the things that we do as a, as a society when you, 
when you said that 90%. So are there any other things that we can do that just make things better? I've got a little plug for the Cornwall Good Seafood Guide, <laughs> seeing as you're doing some plugging. But yeah, certainly finding um, when it comes to seafood, is if you're choosing sustainable, that's very important you choose sustainably caught seafood, but it's also vital that you ask where it came from. And a lot of the seafood offered um, in, in restaurants and in fishmongers shops, even in Cornwall, isn't actually Cornish. You're absolutely right, nearly all of the seafood offered for sale in supermarkets isn't, isn't local. So, um, yeah, look for local suppliers and make sure the seafood you're eating is sustainable. And the, and the website, Cornwall Good Seafood Guide, gives you lots of handy tips and points you in the right direction to make sure you're not harming the environment by choosing the seafood. So basically just ask questions wherever you go is what we're getting from that and I think that is that is the power that we have is to ask questions you don't have to be the one that ties yourself to the railings but you can ask the question and every time you spend your money consumer power is absolutely where it's at in, in terms of being able to control um, what, where, where you get your food from um, and other Could I, could I just add that as well, I think we need to be adaptable. I mean, one of the reasons why our species has been so successful is that we've been very adaptable. None of us really like change, but unfortunately, whether we like it or not, there's change coming, and we need to learn to adapt to that. So are we local, not just with our food? Are we actually doing local events? Do we drive less? Do we use more public transport? Do we reduce our emissions? Do we not want to go on holiday to Spain anymore as frequently as we did, et cetera, et cetera? We need to be challenged by these questions and then be prepared to take action and be adaptable. Yeah, I, 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 and another thing I would um, just add is, is get political. Um, I think as Justin said before, democracy really isn't the best tool, unfortunately, maybe in this case, to deal with a, a long-term, um, absolutely existential problem. And we, we can't be apathetic. We can't just sit back and expect that government's going to sort something out for us. Um, you know, how, however much you, you might feel like you don't get the response that you're looking for, I think we all need to vote and I think we all need to be consistently contacting our MPs, contacting our councillors and letting them know how important this is to us and um, that we're watching them and expecting action um, because we know from voter turnout, you know, it's pitifully low and um, that's, that's, that's what, what we've all got to do. It's our responsibility in a democracy. I'm going to say I'd like to uh, thank Claire and Bryony and the panel and ask everybody to give them a huge round of applause. <laughs> and I'd also like to invite, if you'd like to carry on this conversation, please do so um, in the bar. And on a personal note, there was a few questions about distribution which obviously is the film festival we're delighted to help you with, but it would be great if we could let our documentary makers and producers document what's happening, and it's each and every one of our responsibility to help support the spread of the information so we could all help distribute this work. Thank you so much, Louise, and the festival for having us here. It's been wonderful, and um, yeah, please uh, continue to support us and let other people know about our films. We'll be in the bar. <laughs>